Thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, quick context, um, what is this talk? So um, at one level, it's going to be a Kubernetes overview. So if you know all the Kubernetes things, um, you can probably find a better talk to watch. Um, that said, I also am going to talk about kind of context of, of where this kind of fits in um, and touch a little bit on when you have this collection of containers spread across machines, where do you put your stuff? Where do you store your data? Uh, things like that. So let's get started. So hi, I'm Brian Dorsey. Um, you can catch me on the internet. Um, I try to get my name everywhere. Turns out there's lots of Brian Dorsey's in the world, but I'm going to try to get my name in all the places. This is GoToCon. So I thought we'd do a little choose your own adventure. Um, and we'll, how many people have started a container themselves? OK, we're skipping. OK, well, I won't put you through containers, uh, old way, new way, containers, all this stuff. Um, one thing I think is really relevant is these, um, I just want to kind of touch on containers are these isolated layers of the images that we run the containers from are these isolated uh, collections of files. Um, and this is just a really, really powerful um, thing you know, that we're all very excited about. But one of the things I think is, is interesting is how it changes the timing of where you run into problems. And so in some ways, this pushes a lot of the integration problems up into your continuous integration, your, your build system. And I think that's really powerful. So you can kind of thinking, think of it as early binding um, rather than late binding in your production machines. Um, so I think that's interesting. So containers are awesome. We're all in. Uh, let's run lots of them everywhere. Um, and that's where Kubernetes comes in. So it's, I think we're at this interesting point where we have uh, something new uh, that we can add to our, our, our architectural decisions, our problem solving. When you have a problem and trying to work through things. So we've, got, so we've got physical computers. We can go grab a bunch of computers, and we can connect the network cables and do them. Uh, we can use virtual computers, uh, virtual machines. Um, and the APIs there look almost exactly like the virtual machines, right? You've got uh, give me a computer, put a disk in it, connect these two networks together, that sort of thing. Or we can jump all the way to platform as a service stuff and give me your code and I'll promise to run it and scale it, but you have to write it in a particular way to match you know, Heroku style or App Engine style or you know, whatever the platform as a service gives you. And I'm super excited in this, like in the last year or so, um, there's many, many options now for this, this middle ground of when you want to treat a whole group of machines as one logical computer, and you want to run your containers on lots of the machines, treat them as one. Um, but you want to be working closer to the actual software you have. Um, so that's where we're at, and that's what Kubernetes is. It's one of these container schedulers, orchestrators, uh, these pieces. So um, it is Greek for helmsman. Um, I'm going to probably do this wrong, but I think the original Greek, there's probably someone in the room, is something more like Kubernetes. But it came out of the west coast of the United States, so it's Kubernetes. Sorry. Um, you, it runs and manages containers. Um, it, it is inspired by Google running lots of containers in production. Um, and now that it's been an open source project for a year and a half, it's, it's grown into meeting the needs of a much wider group than just kind of Google. Um, but it's definitely inspired by patterns that we know work at Google. Um, you can run it in multiple different cloud environments. You can run it on your own computers. Um, it supports, of course, Docker, but also you know, Rocket and you know, the AppC stuff and that sort of stuff. It's 100% open source, uh, open source for reals, if you will. Um, it's up on GitHub. The issues are there. Like You can go watch people argue over the code. Um, and the focus is manage applications, not just machines. So this is the slide. Everything at Google runs in containers. There's probably a little asterisk there somewhere. But, but basically, everything that you've ever uh, interacted with Google-wise is running in a container somewhere in the data center. So all you know, Gmail, search maps, um, including if you use things from Google Cloud Platform, so virtual machines, those are also actually running in containers. Um, so it's containers kind of all the way down. And we launch probably more than this now, but over 2 billion containers per week. Um, that's carefully worded. We launch 
2 billion containers a week. Um, and so you can think of Kubernetes as a toolkit for helping you deal with the things you run into in distributed systems regularly. So there's a bunch of stuff that comes up over and over and over. How do the pieces find each other? Um, how do you log consistently? How do you debug? How do you keep things running? How do you figure out where the things should, should run um, to be most efficient? Um, one of the big reasons to do something like a cluster-wide scheduling system is to drive up efficiency and reduce costs. Um, and you know, just better, easier management of the things, all this stuff. And all of these pieces are uh, built into Kubernetes and help you run your applications. So let's start with a cluster. Um, and this could be, and, and I want to kind of break this up, because most of the talk I'm going to spend on kind of using Kubernetes. But there's this, the, if you decide, like if this talk's inspiring, and you're like, yes, I'm going to go play with it, you get to this startup part. And this can be ch challenging. Um, so kind of separate out the getting a cluster running from using uh, a Kubernetes cluster. So you need to get a cluster somehow. Um, you can use cloud resources. You can use your own computers. Uh, you will need an overlay network for the networking. And you'll see why in a few moments. Um, you can run it on some Raspberry Pis. There's some great demos online of people running Kubernetes on raspberries. Um, it, it runs in lots and lots of places. Um, and you know, kind of gratuitous usual graph. Um, you've got a master. It speaks REST HTTP um, to you and the command line tools and the web uh, UIs. And then there is a process running on each of the nodes, so the virtual machines or wherever you're running this, that is the kubelet. And it talks to Docker or whatever your container technology you're using and makes sure that everything is in the state that the cluster wants it to be in. Um, and just to be concrete, so you can grab the slides later, um, you essentially export you know, an environment variable to say, this is the provider I want to use. And you can do the, uh, what I find kind of awkward, uh, curl SSH to pipe to bash. Or you could save that and look at the file and decide to do it yourself. Um, and we have lots of recipes. In fact, arguably too many recipes for how to set up a cluster. Um, and we offer a hosted version as well that I'll talk about. So what it looks like to actually use this. So now we're switching over into the kind of using mode. So if you have an image somewhere, um, this is, for example, the standard Nginx image that's up on Docker Hub, you can, in one line, run two copies of that image somewhere in your cluster and not even need to care or know where those guys are. Um, so let's actually just go do that. OK, so we'll go to demo mode. This is, this is live. Hi. Um, so in the top here, I have, oh, let's actually copy this out. This will be exciting. Doo -doo -doo. You know how when you get into demos, you're like, I should have done that a different way. That's me right now. OK. So I ran that command, and immediately we could, wow, that was, OK, good. Um, it goes to pending and then running down below. And in the bottom half, I'm actually just running the command line tool for Kubernetes, kube control, um, in a watch loop. So I'm actually just running it once a second, three times, once to show at the top which pods are running, which replication controllers, and which services. And so we're going to see this over and over throughout the talk. Um, but basically, at the top, we've got containers that are running. So I just started two containers there. Um, and those are good to go. And so we can, we can say, actually, I wanted to have more of those. Um, so we're going to scale this controller, replication controller. It's called my nginx. And we want, I don't know, four of those, something like that. Um, so we talk to the, the master. It says, oh, hey. Um, four is more than two. I actually only have two running. Let me start the new ones and get up and ready to go. So that's a, a very quick um, kind of feel for what it looks like to actually use this. And, and these, these containers are up and they're running. The configuration of what's supposed to be the state there is now in the server, in, in the cluster. And so if something happens to one of these containers and they crash, they'll get restarted, even if I'm asleep. Um, and it's constantly, um, and we'll talk about this more, but it's constantly checking to say, I've, I've asked for four of them um, and how many are actually there and the like. So this is a pod of whales, and this is a pod of containers, I guess. Um, so 
if you guys were here for the previous talk, um, a, a pod is a collection of containers that are tightly bound. Um, we, are, we strongly believe that this is a very, very valuable abstraction to add into the mix. Um, what this gives you, this is the unit of scheduling in Kubernetes. This is the, the atom. Um, one of these always gets scheduled uh, on one machine. And from the perspective of the containers inside the pod, all of the other containers are on the same logical host. So they can talk to local host networking. They can do IPC. They can see the same volumes, the same disk volumes. But other pods on the same host can't see the same things. So this gives you some really nice properties. Uh, for example, if a whole bunch of your containers, your pods, use listen on port 80, you can schedule multiple pods on the same physical host that all use port 80 because every pod gets its own IP address in the cluster. So every pod has its own IP address. You the pods can talk to each other directly over IPs if you want to. Um, and so that's this idea. So we have this, this little unit. And um, if you missed the talk, I highly recommend uh, seeing the, the previous talk on container patterns. Uh, so check out his slides online. So you can use this for any scenario where you have containers, processes, that need to work together directly. They need to be talking to the same files, to the same you know, local host sockets, that sort of thing. Um, you know, this example here is, you know, for example, if you were going to have a, you know, a Node.js app or a static file serving app, and you wanted it to pull out the actual contents from somewhere else live as it was coming down. So you have these containers that are, the images are static, but when they start up, they pull down and kind of bootstrap the latest content. Um, so this would be an example of kind of um, separating those concerns, the concerns of pulling out the data and serving the data up. So that would be one example. So the way these pods talk to each other, every pod logically has its own, has its own IP address within the cluster. And they can speak directly to each other. Um, and we essentially, you know, in most environments, do IP tables and router firewall, you know, router forwarding rules to make this all happen. Um, but you can also use Flannel, Weave, OpenV switch. Um, and if you're running in AWS or Google Cloud, the cloud environment can help you out and make this fast. Um, and like I said, that means you don't have to worry about conflicting port numbers between your pods. Um, so how do you see, so if we do this, and they can all talk to each other, we've constructed this, this network, this logical network within the cluster. How do you get things, make them available outside the cluster? Um, and you do it with uh, Expose, and Expose creates a service. So in Kubernetes, so service is kind of a, an overloaded word, but a Kubernetes service is basically a load balancer that is aware of exactly where all the pods are for that service and knows how to route traffic specifically to them. So if pods are these ephemeral pieces, they come and go. Our containers, we don't have anything um, long lived in them. We can just reschedule them, put them on different computers. Find, keeping track of their IPs is a challenge. But the service has a static IP address and a DNS entry uh, inside the cluster. And so this is the primary mechanism for kind of service discovery uh, between things in Kubernetes. Um, so it looks something like this. Uh, you, you basically have a service definition, and then it's automatically updated with where, where the pieces are um, because it is part of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that you have this combination of stable service endpoints and ephemeral pods coming and going. Uh, the service can, in fact, even exist before there are any pods connected to it. Um, so you can have, you know, you won't ever get any response back, but you can you can find out its IP address and connect to it. Um, and so clients are always, in most cases, uh, talking to a service endpoint rather than the the actual pods directly. And we stitch all of these things together in Kubernetes with labels. So labels are simply key-value pairs that you can put on anything. So we can put them on pods, we can put them on services, any of the parts of Kubernetes, uh, you can put a, a label on them. And labels are the only grouping mechanism in Kubernetes. So you basically make a query against labels to do things. So for example, if you wanted to draw a dashboard of how things were going on with your front ends, um, you have your pods, you can go ahead and set labels, say, OK, this is a type front end, and we'll do a selector query and get all the data for the type equals front end. And you could also have a different graph somewhere that was like, oh, all the version twos we actually want to show on one graph. And they might refer to the same pods or different ones, but all the version two labels will come back and show. 
Uh, and this is actually how the services are connected to the pods as well. When the, the, ser the service has a selector and when those labels match, that's how it knows which pods to actually route traffic to. Um, so this you know, very nicely addresses this need to connect things without having strict coupling of one person owns the other side or what have you, um, or needs to know about it ahead of time. And this is how replication controllers work as well. So replication controllers are uh, primary concept in Kubernetes, and it's, it's this control loop that you set up and give it a template for how to create a pod and how many pods should be running. And under the covers, when I ran this command over here, um, it actually created both the original two pods and this replication controller implicitly when I made that run command. And the replication controller is what actually does this work of making sure there's always two or always four pods running to do the work. Um, so they basically live in a loop where they look at the real world, look at the uh, desired state, and make whatever changes they need to make to make the real world look like that. Um, so this is a very nice decoupling of needs there. Um, and this is primarily for long running processes. So if you've got things like web front ends, you've got caching servers, you know, things that are meant to be always running, uh, log collectors, things like that. And, and it looks kind of something like this. It, it checks and says, OK, I'm, how many do I actually have? I've got three. I'm supposed to have four. Let me start one. And then just sits there and does this loop logically kind of forever. Um, so this is what uh, gives you fewer pages at night. Um, or at least if you write software like I do, that you know, sometimes you have to track down all of the failures. Um, this will kind of keep it, keep it going while you sleep. Um, so what does this look like? Um, so I, I did this, this one already, but we can, uh, we can just, we basically have a big stereo knob where we can tell the replication controller how many we want to have. When I have two, and it will say, oh, now we're supposed to have two, and it will go down. Um, and this gives you this, this direct control of how many of each of these are supposed to be running. Um, and in lines and boxes, it looks something like this. You've got the actual controller template and the actual labels on the pods. And in this case, uh, we would have a service as well connected to that. Um, in fact, I think what I'm going to do here is I'm going to clean this up a little bit. And we will play with some other fun stuff as this goes. And then when I change it to four, um, it notices that and adds the, the four new pods. So we can use this just as a straight scaling piece, but we can also use it for some other fun patterns. So I don't know if you've heard of a canary pattern, where like, you've got a bunch of workers, and then you get a new version of your app, and you want to try it. I mean, you've tested it already, right? But you want to try it in production, right? And so you want to have some small percentage of your traffic go to the canary. And you want to watch the logs really carefully and see how it works. And then you want to be able to roll back if something bad happened. So you can use replication controllers to make it very easy to do a canary rollout. Um, so we have the same kind of setup. We've got our primary version here ready to go. And then you start version two with a replication controller if it's set to one. And you're good to go. Um, and so if you are happy with that, then you can kind of leave it be. You can add more, remove them. It's very easy to pull that back out. Um, and you, if you decide you like it, you can do what's called a rolling up update, where you add more of these. So, um, and this is such a useful thing. We've actually built it into both the, the front end tool, and now uh, there's a deployments piece built into the master API. So you can tell the master you want to roll between versions. Um, and that looks something like this. And we're going to do a more involved demo here. So uh, basically, it goes. You have two knobs, and so you, you end up turning up one and turning down the other bit by bit. And eventually, all of your traffic is being served by the new piece. So let's, let's look at that for real. Uh, da, da, da. Awesome. OK. In fact, OK, so we have, 
I'm going to show you a guestbook app because this is you know what we have to do. Uh, and so this is a PHP app. It's PHP. Uh, we're actually using MySQL and some memcache um, and make make a whole app here. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and start the. I'm going to show you these files in just a moment, but. One th so the, the first version, the first command lines I was showing you were basically interactive, talking to the cluster, right? Run, run me this image and just make me some stuff. But in production, that's not really what you want. You want configuration checked in uh, safe somewhere, right? So I'm going to actually create some items from um, a front end service, and we'll look at that, and also the front end uh, replication controller. So what these files look like. So this is a YAML doc. I don't know, if, is that visible up there? Um, that basically, you know, it, sorry, it's very, very simple. Um, the key part is this is our name. We're going to expose port 80 from port 80, uh, and we're going to the selector, so the query we're going to use, we're going to look for all the pods that are labeled front end and this next demo uh, app name. So I've given these labels and set that up and created this service. Um, that was the first command I run. And so we have a new service down here that's called front end. Um, one extra little fun bit in here is I said type load balancer. And this kicks off and tells Kubernetes that we want this to be an external outside of the cluster load balancer. And since I'm running this on um, Container Engine in Google Cloud, this actually means we're going to configure the Google Cloud load balancer, which is basically Google's data center level load balancers, which is super fun. So I can be on the same load balancer that runs Gmail and YouTube, um, and actually get that um, to distribute the traffic to my VMs. Um, and then the other file we ran here is the replication controller. And so this contains how many replicas we want to run of our front end. Uh, that's here. And the selector so that we know which pods are, are part of our group. It's actually the same as the service. And the template for making a new pod when the time comes. So whenever it needs to make a new pod for whatever reason, it will use this template to create it. Um, and the key bit right here is we're pointing at a Docker image in the Google Container Registry. Um, and it's, it's in this project name, next demo 42. The image is named PHP Guestbook and the version, so colon, then it's tagged, docker-wise, v1. And that's this name, and it uses port 80. So we've done all that bit. Um, and down here, we can see the front end load balancer got set up with an IP. So we should be able to hit this IP address. And this is the dangerous part of the thing, if people can read the small uh, bit down there. Hello. I can say even hello, Berlin, if I can spell it correctly. Yay. And you can hit that same IP address and put script tags in there and all kinds of fun stuff and see how that, that turns out. Um, so we've got this. Um, and then we can say cube, CTL. So actually, let me, I'm going to go ahead. I've got this um, little extension that will refresh the page every second. So that's going to start flickering in the background and updating as other people are, are adding things. And hey, it looks like emoji works. Um, and so we can actually scale the replication controller named front end and set replicas equal to six, for example. Um, and we can start new replicas, get them in serving traffic. And, and everybody in the audience and myself who's sitting here refreshing, the, the site just stays up and keeps working. Um, we can drop it back down to three, um, have fun with the whole deal. So that's neat. But as soon as you get something working, there's always a feature request, right? And this is kind of a, a dull site. We want to make it way better, right? So I got the request to make the site better. And my uh, design skills are perhaps lacking, but um, I've got a new version of the site that's come out of my um, continuous integration system. And it's pushed up into the container registry, and it's called green. So we've got this guy here. And so what I'm going to do is 
uh, try to remember the exact command line, which I won't, so we're going to we're going to do a little trickery. So I'm going to run cube control, rolling update, the front end, uh, the update period here, which is cut off the screen. Um, I'm setting to one second, which is not a normal thing to do in production. So the update period is how long to wait between uh, steps here. Um, set it to one second, and then I'm going to rolling upgrade to this new Im image called green. And what's happening here now is it's managing the two dials for us. So I've got the site up and running, and I'm slowly cha changing the traffic over to the new version of the app uh, while, while it's running. Um, and it looks like I've messed up the view there. Let's see. So we can see the, um, the in-progress controller that it made has a big, long name. And the, the new um, pods have this name, just to kind of make sure that they've got stuff going there. And we've got all kinds of hacking going on on the site. Fantastic. Um, some, some of the things worked, and some of them don't. Um, and, and we're basically just turning these, these knobs, one up and one down, as we go. And then when the last one goes away, uh, we should see, by the time the last one goes away, we should see the new version. Um, when, when it actually switches depends on you know, kind of which of the pods I was connected to. And hey, we got the new version. So that's amazing, right? Thank you. Um, so the thing that I find really awesome about this, besides my incredible design skills, um, is that so we, you know, we migrate our live site up, right? But if we decide we don't like this anymore, we can actually migrate back using the exact same process. So since we've got this isolated file system, these containers under the covers, you know, forward and back is actually exactly the same process. So if you decide later that you don't like, you know, you don't like that, you can actually switch this back to version 1. And you know, we can rolling upgrade that back. And I won't make you like, watch that, but we can come back to it uh, later. Um, and hopefully you guys won't completely uh, destroy my, my account there. Um, so also just recently added, and this is still in beta, we have auto scaling. And auto scaling right now is based on the CPU usage of the pods. Um, so you can basically set up a scale target, um, which says, you know, if too much, too many, if the pods are over 50%, we need to increase the number of pods that are running in our cluster. And so what we do is we're actually using C Advisor. I don't know if, if you're familiar with that to like get all the metrics out of the running containers, pushing that up through this app called Heapster, which aggregates all of these, and then we actually know relatively close to real time exactly what's going on with all the containers across the whole cluster. And so we can set rules, basically, that says, hey, if you know, we have pods that are you know, over 50%, which our rule says, we need more pods. And then instead of me turning the dial, we have a robot turn the dial. And you know, so we can actually have the scale target drive how many pods are actually running in our cluster. Um, so the currently, CPU is the, is the one that's there. We're definitely working on more, uh, more options for you know, the actual thresholds to do that, and including you know, pushing your own metrics through Heapster and using that to drive the auto scaling. Um, so that's there. And all kinds of other fun stuff there. So you guys have probably noticed that almost every uh, demo of containers is, is using some like, very simple like, web server or stateless app or uh, other things. Like, and most of these demos were as well. Um, Technically, my MySQL is actually backed by something that lives, but I'm going to blow it away. Um, but, but almost all the demos are, are stateless, right? And, and I have questions about this. And also, I think as an industry, we're trying to kind of resolve this, right? It's, it's clear that there's these really fun, uh, th there are great advantages to keeping all the state out of your containers. You can then treat them like these disposable things. But you build apps to keep track of things, right? So at some point, we've got to like, manage this data. And we, we really care about it. Um, that said, I, th I think this is, I'd love to hear anybody who has a different opinion. I think in a cluster of all these ephemeral containers, we have to keep the state out of the container, or at least out of any one container, um, at a bare minimum, um, and, and probably just out of all the containers. 
So if that's the case, what do we do here? Um, and I'd like to share three of the patterns that I've seen so far um, and some examples of people using that. And I'd love to hear if you've run into anything that doesn't fit into one of these patterns. That would be very interesting. Um, but before we get to that, Docker has volumes, and Kubernetes has volumes as well. And they're kind of, it's kind of a superset of the things you can do in Docker. So when you've got this pod, it has some local disk available if you configure it that way. So you can do things like a temporary empty directory you know, that just you know, lives and dies with the pod, so you can kind of have scratch space. Um, you can, if you want to, you can break out and put files on your host machines. Um, it's up to you then to figure out where, which machine those are on as you get scheduled on different nodes or use uh, some of the tools in Kubernetes to make sure you always get scheduled on the same node. Um, and then you lose flexibility there. Um, you can also use you know, NFS if you have managed to create a really reliable NFS system. Um, or you can plug into iSCSI. So you can do that if you've got an iSCSI system. Um, or if, you, if you're running in a cloud provider that has a block storage service, uh, you can use that. So we have plugins for uh, EBS and for um, our Google Cloud um, block store. So we need. We probably need some storage. So we're going to come back. That's why I hit this here. So we're going to come back to these guys. So I think the three big options for how to store state in a system that's made up of all these ephemeral containers is just you're already putting it somewhere. You have a database team, probably, perhaps. Keep doing what you're already doing, right? Like run your database the way you know how to do it and it's safe, um, and connect to it from inside the cluster. So one option is just straight up, it's outside the cluster. You run the database you know, as, you know, as yeah, I'm not going to make the joke. Uh, anyway, so you just run the database the way you've been doing it. Um, so that's one option. Another option is that you take something that really wants to run on one computer all the time, and you kind of swap the storage out from underneath it so that by the time it comes up, wherever it comes up, it thinks it's on the same machine all the time. And so this is where having a block store set up in your environment, something like Ceph, or you know, the, the block stores in your cloud provider are really, really handy because Kubernetes knows how to take a block store and connect it to the host and plumb it up through to the container through the pods before it starts the pods. So you can actually, and that's the way this MySQL was running, you can basically set up a volume that is always available to one pod at a time um, and, and make that work. So you can do that. Um, and you know, there may be some latency things, but it works in a, a wide variety of cases, and it's a good way to adapt systems that already exist. Um, and then the third option is to do something that's, that's very aware of this world of things coming and going that's cluster native. So I'm thinking of things like Cassandra, React. Um, it's, it's very new, but CockroachDB. Um, things of this nature which are already distributed systems they're aware of the fact that nodes come and go. Um, in a Kubernetes environment, the nodes are going to come and go faster than they're used to. So there's, there may be some extra things you want to do. And we've got a, an ongoing example that we're working on with data stacks in the examples folder of Kubernetes on how to do some of that plumbing. Um, but you can use databases that are aware of the fact that they're on multiple machines. So I think that's your three options. So basically, like keep it out of the cluster, adapt it to the cluster, or use something that's aware of being in clusters. Um, another option here in the kind of cluster native space is called Vitesse. I don't know if you guys have heard of this. It's an open source project from Google. It's the system that's been serving all the YouTube database traffic on MySQL since 2011. Um, and so this does all the hard work of sharding and setting up replication and things for MySQL. Um, and they have Kubernetes configurations included with that. Um, so that may be something to look into. There's another kind of state. Uh, so if we're going to keep all the configuration out of our, of our containers, right, how do we get them connected to our secure services, to our databases, to our APIs? We need some way of getting the, the actual stuff in there. Um, and one way of doing it is environment variables. Um, Kubernetes has decided to go with something that we think is a little bit more secure. Uh, environment variables are very introspectable uh, on purpose. 
Um, so we have this concept of a named secret. And basically, the cluster admin can configure named secrets. And the, if you have permission, the, the, the pod templates, so the replication controllers or the pod creations, you basically say, I want to mix this named secret into my file system in this location so that I, I know that in you know, slash whatever is my password uh, every time I start up. And it's up to the cluster environment, you know, the cluster admin, to configure what passwords are actually there in that spot. Um, so this lives all in tempfs. It never hits a disk on any of the nodes. Um, if you turn the machines off, it all goes away. Um, but this is a mechanism for getting that configuration of secret information in there. Um, we also have environment variables and labels and you know, that kind of stuff that you can use for other config. So Kubernetes uh, was open sourced in June 2014, so we're approaching a year and a half old. It hit 1.0 um, this year. We hit 1.1 last month. And uh, we have a hosted version of this that's called Container Engine as part of the Google Cloud Platform. Um, it's already in use by several uh, platforms as a service folks. So the Red Hat uh, OpenShift folks actually tore out their kind of orchestration layer and put Kubernetes in under, the, uh, under there. They've been extremely active contributors to the project. Um, also, Dias and Stratos, and I think there's another that I'm forgetting um, that, are, that are using Kubernetes, uh, building kind of a more user-friendly or m sometimes more adjusted to certain environments uh, platforms. And then there's multiple distributions. So if you want to run this on your own machines, uh, Core OS Tectonic, you're going to hear next from Mesos folks. Uh, definitely stick around for that on how Kubernetes and Mesos fit together. Uh, working towards a 1.2 release. So I just wanted to quickly show um, if, so separating out this like setting up a cluster from using the cluster, I think it's kind of hard to tell whether you care enough to set one up in like your environment until you've used it a bit. So I strongly recommend using Container Engine, Google Container Engine, to set up a cluster to play with. Wherever you plan on running it in the long term, it's definitely, definitely the easiest way to just get a cluster up. And by easy, I mean you hit this button, you give it a name, and pick where you want to run it. So we probably want to run it in Europe. Uh, pick the size machines, how many of those machines, and hit the button. And three or four minutes later, you have a cluster that's ready to go. So this is my recommendation for how to play with Kubernetes wherever you plan on running it uh, long term. Uh, Kubernetes is completely open source for reals. Uh, please, if this is something interesting to you, take a look at it. Um, fill issues if you run into any trouble when you get started um, trying to play with it. If you've got use cases where it doesn't work for you for whatever reason, we'd love to hear about that. Um, the reason Kubernetes is uh, in the place it is right now is because of the open source community um, that's, that's grown around it. Um, it's been amazing. So please, please join us um, there. And I'd like you to think about like, the applications you have, uh, the things you're doing right now, and where they kind of fit in the abstractions. You know, do they run on physical machines? Do they run on virtual machines? Is it time for a cluster of containers using PaaS? Or do different parts of the app actually be a more natural fit in different parts of it? You know, a really common pattern we see for Google Cloud customers is to put part of the app in App Engine, just, that just as HP requests, boom, 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 boom. And then another big part is not going to be off on virtual machines. So think about your applications and how, how they fit. And I really think you have a new kind of architectural choice, a uh, new option at least, uh, we'll say option, uh, to think about. So thank you all very, very much. That's the end of the talk. Yay. Thank you, Brian. And we have questions? We have a number of questions. Excellent. So first question is about replica controllers. Uh, there are actually two questions. One is, are replica controllers like a single point of failure? Ah. And why is the replica controller separate from the scheduler? Or is it actually not an actual separate component? OK. So let's do the first one of theirs. Is the replication controller a single point of failure? Um, the replication controller is a logical, uh, is a logical thing. It's, it's part of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, it's actually implemented at, as a single process on the master. So there is a master that is a single point of failure that's implementing the replication controller. Um, that said, um, 
you know, the, the whole backend for that is etcd. So there's a strong uh, deterministic consensus protocol behind that. And there are definitely people already uh, running multiple masters you know, in standby mode. Um, so you can have you know, multiple processes ready to do the work on different physical machines there. Also, if something does go wrong, since we have the, um, the kind of detailed management pushed out to all of the nodes, if you lose the master for some period of time, the current configuration just stays. All the networking keeps working. Um, the services stay working. If individual containers die, they get restarted. Um, the system stays going. It's just that you can't change it until you have a master to talk to uh, there. So the second question was? Uh, is the replica controller separate from the scheduler? But I presume the scheduler is also running in the, in the master as well. Yeah, so it, it, is, it is separate. Um, so, and, it, and very much on purpose, because it's pluggable. So we have new controllers now. Uh, so for example, we have a jobs controller that is specifically designed to help you do batch workloads. So if you want to make sure that 1,000 copies of this container run, even if some of them fail, like don't care which machines they're on, the batch job controller is there for you. So the replication controller, what it does is it just, it's actually a process that's just talking to the Kubernetes APIs. So you, if you want to make the, the special phase of the moon controller that does more process pods when the moon's in a certain phase or what have you, you can totally do that uh, using the same APIs that replication controller does. So uh, yes, scheduler is separate. And when you request to Kubernetes, give me a new pod, then the scheduler kicks in and decides where to put that. Um, and it's mostly kind of spreading the work out right now. But as we get more metrics plugged in through the Heapster work, they're actively working on uh, doing this kind of multi-dimensional Tetris game of finding out where the best place to put a pod is for memory, disk, you know, CPU, all the things. Um, next question is related to the presentation itself. Uh, the, the source code of the application and the command line uh, calls that you did, are they part of the slides as well? Or um, you have a so they are in the slides. And I will, in fact, so I, I will do a live pointer, um, but also kind of add them there as well. So this is the Kubernetes GitHub repo. Um, 11,000 stars, 21,000 commits. Um, and there's an example folder here. The, uh, the example that I did was the guestbook example. Okay. So you can, you can run this guestbook example yourself. I think this, this example might be slightly newer than the exact version that I ran. And, and the, the amazing update to the design is not here. But <laughs> Exactly. Okay, uh, next question. Um, someone asked how much manpower, how much time is actually needed to get really up to speed from zero to have kind of enough Kubernetes understanding to run a or set up and run a successful uh, Kubernetes setup. So how much time is, do you need to actually kind of get started with Kubernetes? I think um, there's a, two parts to that question. I think the more complicated part is actually um, getting the experience to kind of run a, a cluster in production well. There's, there's lots of challenges that are really outside of Kubernetes there around networks and uh, you know, keeping everything happy there. Um, for Kubernetes itself, for like building an application that's going to run in Kubernetes, I think if you spent several days with the concepts and worked through some of the examples, you would be in a really good place to begin porting you know, one of your applications. Um, in fact, probably within the first day, um, definitely look, look at the different concepts. The things you really need, I talked about in this talk. You need pods, you need replication controllers, and you need services. And, and you need to have some process that you've made a Docker image of that lists on a port or something, you know, that d does something outside of the, the container. And if you have those things, you can probably actually already go and look at some of the examples and make a config that runs them. Or literally just run the kube control run command that I did that creates the configs for you. The, the very first command that's in the slides. Yeah. Cool. Um, um, question to canaries. Uh, when you do canaries, how do you make sure that the user gets back the same uh, version of the service, the same label of the service? Right. Uh, does um, the load balancer do sticky sessions? or? So um, we're doing, so it depends on the load balancer you're using to get into the Kubernetes cluster. And then um, Kubernetes itself does some, some work there. So it, it's, a it's a little bit complex. It's not. Um, so if you want to make sure, let's say how, how, let's say how we do this. Um, 
if you're just running a default setup on Container Engine on Google Cloud, the Google Cloud load balancer will use client IP affinity. And that will get you to a specific node, which then also will kind of use some affinity to get you to the same pod. Um, but it, depending on the environment you're running in, that may not be the case. So um, if you need to make sure for your app that you always hit the version 2 and you want to do that, um, it may make sense to actually add two services. So you add a second service for that and give it a different like subdomain name or what have you. Um, and then you can ensure that the traffic hits there um, okay. in that way. Cool. Uh, two configuration questions. Uh, one is, is there a declarative way to control replication controllers uh, yes. similar uh, to a Borg CFG update? Oh. And uh, <laughs> the other question, which is also configuration uh, dependent, is um, how does the fixed information about number of replicas in the, uh, in the um, configuration in the YAML file uh, relate to the auto-scaling. But I think there are just entries for auto-scaling. Yeah, kind of the same, same thing here. So this is one version of the declarative representation of a replication controller. And um, I'll, I can't really address the board config aspect of that question. Um, but this is um, defining how a replication controller should be when it's pushed up into a Kubernetes cluster. Um, as far as how that relates to the actual value of, for example, the number of replicas, especially if you've got, if I've changed them later or you're using auto-scaling, um, this version you would have checked in somewhere and you, you push it out when you create the, the initial replication controller. And then over time, the system will adjust you know, to match the actual load that's there. Um, so if you, if you wanted to feed that back somehow into your actual kind of default configs, you'd need to add um, to pull this config back down and, and kind of check it back in and diff it. Um, this is a YAML document we're looking at here. The actual API speaks JSON. You can make cube control spit out uh, the raw uh, JSON or YAML converted version of the document that comes back from the REST API. So if you want to pull down what the server knows of the current state and get that out as one of these documents that you could check in, you can do that uh, oh, cool. from Cube Control. That's good to know. Um, questions around security. Uh, so one question I have actually is, can you limit visibility of uh, the shared secrets to a single container within a pod, or is it always the whole pod? Because otherwise you can use like some evil injection thing to access yes. actually the file system. Totally. Um, so we're, we're working to improve the granularity of security, for sure. Okay. Uh, right now, the security in Kubernetes uh, is very kind of uh, cluster level. There's also a concept of namespaces. So like all the stuff I did was in this default namespace. You can have different slices of the same cluster that are namespaced apart from each other. And they have their own services and replication controllers and pods and all that sort of stuff. Um, and there's some security stuff there. If you need the very granular security today. Um, I definitely recommend taking a look at what some of the Red Hat Enterprise folks are doing with security. They've, they've mixed the security in with their existing enterprise you know, stuff, and, and that should be of interest, I think. OK. Sorry, a little vague and there. Um, last question is about, um, at the end, you showed how to spin up a cluster uh, for such a setup. Uh, and the question is, uh, all the instances had the same size uh, in, ah, in your yes. example. Yep. Uh, but I think that might be controllable which so, sizes. So um, are all the instances the same size? So yes, uh, when, you, when you create it by default. Um, in fact, unless you go out of your way to uh, kind of create your own instances manually and join them into a cluster, all of the scripts that create you know, Kubernetes clusters will create homogenous clusters. Um, so you've got a couple options. Um, we actually think in almost all the cases, that's really what you want. But if you have physical machines that are already different, um, and you need to use them differently. You can actually label them. You can label the actual nodes, and you can create um, constraints on the, the deployment docs that you make to say that, you know, for example, um, I need to be on a node that has a good GPU. And so you can label the nodes with GPUs, and then you can actually label your, your pod templates saying, you know, requires a GPU. Um, it's not strictly answering that question, but, but basically we normally do homogenous uh, yeah, machines. Makes sense. Um, and it helps with scheduling a lot. Um, that will, 
if that's really important to you, like definitely talk to me afterwards, and we'll try to get that into the mix. Yeah. And a question related to that, uh, do you have an example of a declarative uh, deployment uh, script where you define kind of which kind of uh, machines you want to, to run your cluster on? Uh, no, I do not have that. Online somewhere? Or? Yeah, so yeah, okay. we have scripts for creating cluster. Um, and there are, you know, are some, yeah, I should probably chat with that person afterwards. Like the actual yeah. cluster setup is kind of a different okay, space. Okay, cool. Yep. Yeah, that's it, uh, I think, for questions. Oh, no, there's. Uh, I think you answered all the other ones. Cool. Uh, awesome. Don't forget to rate the talk. Thank you all um, very, very much. That's thank awesome you. questions. Thank you, Brian. It was a really imp impressive talk. And yep. <laughs>